Greetings. This is a reading of the book The Airship Golden Hind. Some of the language in this book has not aged well and is indeed no longer politically correct. Take caution when listening to this visual audio book. Footage and photography are provided by Photations. At Photations, we believe that the world would be a better place if people spend their time being creative, join us in practicing art so we all can be the master of our fine art prints available at our store www.fortationstore.com. Keep our artwork alive by making a donation at fortationsdonations.com. The Airship Golden Hind by Percy F. Westerman Chapter 11 with Intent Where are we now? Inquired Kenny on returning to the navigation room to relieve his chum as officer of the watch. It was now 12 o'clock. Bremsden had just shot the sun and was reading off the degrees, minutes, and seconds from the arc of the sextant. Almost over Algiers, old thing, he replied, pointing to the glaring sun-baked Algerian coast. Hark. He held up his hand and inclined his head sideways above the base hum of the aerial propeller came the distant report of a gun. It reminds a fellow of old times when the Archies got busier marked Kenyon. Our friends, the French are evidently treating us to a salute to help us on our weary way, rejoined Peter. Goodness only knows how we are to return it we can't give gun for gun. He focused his glasses on the white buildings three thousand feet below. The whole of the water front of Algiers was packed with figures with upturned faces Frenchmen, Algerines, Arabs, and Nubians all frantically waving to the huge airship as she sped eastwards. In ten minutes, the Golden Hind had left the capital of France's African possessions for Astern unless anything untoward occurred. Another four hours would bring her within sight of Malta. You might cast your eye over the signal log book before you take on remarked Bramson. Kenyon did so. Evidently, the wireless operator had been kept busily employed, for there were dozens of messages wishing the Golden Hind Bond voyage, but amongst them were two of a different nature. One announced that an American airship eagle, under the command of Commodore Theodore Nye, had left Tampa Town bound for Colon, followed by a supplementary message that the eagle had left the Panama Canal zone and was last sighted flying in a westerly direction, making allowance for the difference in New York and Greenwich times. Both the Golden Hind and her Yankee rival had started practically simultaneously from their respective points of departure for the actual race. The second wireless message transmitted via Vancouver, Newfoundland, and Paul Dew was to the effect that the Banzai, the Japanese quadruplet piloted by Count Hiyashi, had started from Nagasaki at a speed estimated at 220 miles an hour. Artful blighter, that chap, declared Bramston. He's kept his design carefully up his sleeve till the last moment we thought he was attempting the flight in an airship but he's pinned his faith to a gigantic quadruplin. Two hundred and twenty miles an hour to Addy Kenyon. That means he'll do the whole trip in less than one hundred twenty hours of actual flying, unless something goes wrong with his bus, my word, some speed. What I'd like to know is his petrol consumption and how much juice does his bus carry remarked Ramsden thoughtfully. I drove we're up against something, old son. By the by, I see there's no news of Fritz, said Kenneth. Not a word, replied Peter. Mon Sensic evidently thinks that it's too early to start writing. We'll hear either from or of him before night. 
Foster Dyke is trying to call him up by wireless and tell him that he has a friend of his on board. Oh, that greasy merchant rejoined Kenneth. How did he get on? Played possum, answered Bramson. Foster Dyke tried to put the wind up him, but it was a frost. I'd like to know what he did to the shackle on the marine buoy. You think he cast us adrift? Without a doubt, old Berg. Kenyon shook his head doubtfully. He might have been simply fishing when the pen drew and he got whisked aloft. He suggested did he give his name or any particulars. Not he, replied Peter. In fact, he wasn't. As Fuster Egg went for him bald-headed and tried to make him admit that he was in von Synthic's pay. But nothing doing. Even when we made out that we were going to drop him overboard well, cheerio, all thing. Left in charge of the airship, Kenyon pondered over the problem of whether the man he had rescued had really been a secret agent of Juan Senzig or otherwise. If he were, then it would be almost a foregone conclusion that he spoke German. Kenneth had plenty of time for reflection during his trick the golden hind was making good progress there was little or no wind and her drift was in consequence almost imperceptible while the temperature was so constant that there was no necessity to alter the volume of brodium in the ballonets for hours at a strike the motors to ran like clockwork and beyond attending to the semi-automatic lubricators occasionally, the air mechanics on duty had little to do fustered ache. Having paid a brief visit to the navigating room, retired to his cabin to make up a rearies of sleep. My work, soliloquous Kenneth, reflectively. I'll tackle fostered ache about it next time I come across him. At four in the afternoon, Malta was passed. At a distance of ten miles to the south, the Golden Hind was doing well, maintaining more than her normal cruising speed. If she were able to keep on at that rate, she would accomplish the voyage of circumnavigation well under the twenty days, but that was now but a secondary consideration. At all costs, von Sins 64 must be overhauled. The Golden Hind's first stop was at Alexandria, sixteen hours after leaving Gibraltar, she made a fullest landing on Sandy Spit that separates Lake Mariotis from the Mediterranean. The time of her arrival had been notified by wireless, and all preparations had been made for her reception. Keenly interested, Tommy's manned the trail ropes and secured her firmly to enters buried in the sand. Lorries laden with petrol and oil were rushed to the spot, and the work overflowing began without delay while Foster Dyke and Kenyon were signing the control certificate and holding an informal reception of almost the whole of the British colony at Alexandria. Bramston remained in charge of the airship in order to keep back the dense crowd composed of Fellaheen cops, Arabs, Syrians, and representatives of every nation bordering on the Mediterranean strong biscuits of British troops were posted around the tethered airship. No unauthorized person being permitted to approach within a hundred yards of the Golden Hind, all to enable the work of refueling to proceed as rapidly as possible in an improvised aerodrome was brilliantly illuminated by portable searchlights mounted on motor lorries. It seemed as if it would be impossible for any suspicious characters to approach the airship without being detected having once been bitten. Foster Dick was not taking chances in that direction. No attempt had been made to get rid of Enrico yours. Closely watched by a couple of the crew, he was even permitted to view the proceedings from an open scuttle in one of the compartments 
on the starboard side. When everything was in readiness to resume the voyage, Foster Dake and Kenny shook hands with their entertainers and crossed the guard square as they approached the entry port on the starboard side. A dark figure suddenly appeared from behind an unattended lorry and at a distance of ten paces fired half a dozen shots in rapid succession straight at the baronet. Almost at the first report, Foster Dyke threw himself at full length upon the sand. Kenyon, without hesitation, rushed upon the would-be assassin, while two of the crew, leaping from the fuselage, promptly seized the miscreant and deprived him of his automatic pistol. Her sir asked Kenyon anxiously. Not a bit of it, replied Sir Reginald coolly. That fellow couldn't hit a haystack at five yards. Bring him along, then. An edited member of the Egyptian Soul Series, accompanied by a couple of staff officers, hurried up, and after making inquiries and learning that Foster Dake was unhurt, suggested, not without good reason, that the would-be assassin should be handed over to the civil powers for trial. The baronet airily swept aside the suggestion. Sorry, Pansitart, he said, but I'm not going to waste precious time appearing as a prosecutor in this business. No, I'm not exactly professing to take the law into my own hands, but I propose taking the gentleman with me. If he tried to shoot me, surely I can jolly well kidnap him to new rate possessions nine points of the law. When I've done with him, you can deal with him. But dash it all, man exclaimed one of the staff officers. You aren't going to detain him. Not much, declared the baronet return good for evil sort of thing, you know. Don't get flustered. Answer tart, he's mine, and we're just off. Happening to glance up as he entered the fuselage, Foster Dyke caught sight of Enrico Yours, who had seen the whole incident through one of the windows. Birds of a feather, he soliloquized. However, I don't suppose we'll pick up pals of this sort at every place we touch already, Kenyon. He inquired, raising his voice right o. Let go.